Praise the Lord. I'm Andrew Womack, and I welcome you to the Gospel Truth Broadcast. On this program, we are going to be dealing with the subject of marriage. And actually, this is going to be our first teaching in a series of 12 where we deal with the subject of marriage. We're going to be dealing with all aspects of marriage, talking about the priority that marriage should occupy in your life, talking about what causes strife and how you can diffuse strife in your marriage, dealing with God's kind of love, talking about the responsibilities of the husband and the wife, and also dealing with uh, submission and then even sex in marriage. But on this first session, I'd like to just begin to deal with some of the basic fundamentals of marriage. First of all, let me say that marriage today is under attack, I believe, in a way that we've not ever seen before. And there's good reason for it. Because marriage is the most fundamental, uh, basic building block of society even stronger than uh, governments, and even stronger than the church itself is the family. Did you know churches are comprised of people that are in family units? And if the families are falling apart, Satan can make the message and the ministry of the church ineffective. If all of the Christians are suffering under their own problems, it can actually affect the preaching of the gospel. So marriage, family, is something that affects every area of our society there has never been a society in the history of the world that once the family's decay has been able to last over very, just a very short period of time. And I believe that because of that, Satan is attacking marriage with a vengeance. And if you were in a military battle and if Satan attacked you on one flank and threw all of this uh, uh, you know, weapons and troops and ammunition, all of these things against you, if you were in a military campaign, you would have to respond in that place with an equal or greater force. And I don't believe that the body of Christ has been doing that in the area of marriage. We've kind of let it go, just feeling that if you're a Christian and if you've got your life straight with God, that marriage will automatically work. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know that that is not so. There's a lot of people who really love God with all of their heart, and yet they're having problems in the area of marriage simply because we haven't taken the instruction from God's Word and applied it to our marriage. God's Word has an answer for every problem that you'll face in marriage. And I want to encourage you with that. We aren't going to be dealing in psychology. We aren't going to be talking about some peripheral issues, what I consider to be peripheral issues. But we're going to be going right to the heart of it. What does God's Word have to say? God is the one that created marriage. God is responsible for marriage. If God creates something and then gives it to us, I believe that God also bears a responsibility to tell us how to make it work. If He didn't, He would be irresponsible. And of course, we know that God isn't irresponsible. There's nothing wrong with marriage. God created marriage. It was a God-given idea. But the problem has been that we aren't taking marriage and using God's principles. We've gotten to where we run marriage our own way. We feel like that that's our part of our life and we somehow or another segment our life into the secular and into the religious realm. But Christ needs to permeate every area of our life. There is an answer for your marriage. And we're going to be talking about many, many aspects of that. On this tape, I want to deal with what is the purpose of marriage. And you know, this is such a simple statement. Some people may think, well, this is, this is elementary. You don't need this. But you know, I really believe that this is where marriage gets off on the wrong foot. People expect the wrong things of marriage. Over here in Genesis chapter 2 is where we see the Lord instituting marriage. And in Genesis 2.18, the scripture says, and the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now this scripture shows God creating marriage. God came up with the idea. God is responsible for it. And it says specifically here that he made the woman to be a help meet for the man. The word meet means sufficient or able. Now I want to deal on this purpose of, uh, I mean on this principle of what is the purpose of marriage. Most people, I feel, actually look to marriage to make them happy, to make them fulfilled, to supply them with companionship, to uh, do all kinds of things in their life. And that is not what these scriptures right here are saying. Marriage was created for Adam, who was sinless, who was pure. He didn't have loneliness. Now, I believe that loneliness came as a result of the fall. And that doesn't mean that he didn't maybe have a need for companionship, but he wasn't desperate the way that we see people today. Adam was not a desperate person that just had to have somebody to fellowship with. He was totally bummed out being by himself. That was not the purpose of God creating a help meet for him. Adam was not a person who was just weak and inferior and he needed somebody else to bolster him up. Adam was complete. Adam didn't need marriage 
because of weaknesses, because of inadequacies, because of any of these things that many times today we see people justifying marriage for. Many people come into marriage thinking, I've got to have somebody, I'm just so lonely. Other people come into marriage thinking, well, I've got to have the physical relationship, I just can't survive without it. Other people come in and think that I've just got to have this emotional benefit. I've got to have this, uh, you know, somebody there to talk to and all of these kind of things. Adam, that wasn't his problem. Now, I'll grant you that one of the purposes of marriage is for procreation. And that's evident here. The Lord gave him that command over in the first chapter, verse 26. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I would like to mention that there was something even greater than that. The Lord here said that he was going to make the woman a help meet, particularly suited for this man. I believe that the real purpose in marriage is not for the physical relationship, not for the emotional benefit, not for it so that you won't be lonely, so that uh, you can be fulfilled in all of these things, but rather it's the power of agreement. Now we can see that in a lot of scriptures. Over here in Genesis, the 11th chapter is a good example of this, that the... That the um, People right after the flood came and they began to start building the Tower of Babel. And in Genesis chapter 11, verse 5, it says that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing shall be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad on the face of the earth. The Lord here came down and saw the unity, the oneness that man had, and the Lord saw that nothing could be restrained unto him. There was power in this unity, even power to the degree that God saw it threatening his plan for mankind. They had now unified in a negative way, in an evil way to accomplish evil instead of good, and the Lord saw it threatening his kingdom, and he had to come down and do something about it. Now, if you'd stop and think about it, that is awesome. That's an awesome statement about the power that's in unity for good or for evil. And I believe that this is exactly the reason that God created a mate for Adam is because by doing that, he didn't just have two people with the same power and together they were twice as good as one. But there's something that happened. There's a multiplying effect when you get people together in unity like this. And of course, the husband and wife relationship is the strongest bond of unity that we have. And when you get two people together that become one flesh like that, it doesn't just yield the power of two individuals, but it actually has a multiplying effect so that you have like 10 times as much power. God was able to actually multiply Adam's effectiveness, power, and dominion that he was supposed to be using in ruling the earth. It's tremendous. There's another scripture on this out of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And this scripture says in verse 9, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, in these scriptures, the Lord here is definitely showing the power that is in this unity, that's in this agreement. And uh, there, I believe that that is the purpose that God created marriage for, is for this agreement, for this unity. Marriage is more than just cohabiting together. It's until we recognize this unity and begin to experience this oneness that God talks about, we haven't really experienced the purpose of marriage. If we try and place any other demand on marriage, if we try and use marriage to fulfill these other areas of our life, we can actually frustrate ourselves, be disappointed, and then get bitter towards marriage for not fulfilling something in our lives that marriage never was intended to be. Did you, let me share a scripture with you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And this passage of scripture, I tell you, this just blows some people away, but I want to, I minister kind of by a shock technique. I say things that are so shocking to you that you'll listen to hear what I'm, how I'm going to talk my way out of this. In verse 39, it says, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Now Paul here was saying, uh, talking about marriage, he was saying that a woman was happier if she remained unmarried. 
Now that's an awesome statement. Did you know that the vast majority of people listening to me, Christians, would really look at marriage and expect marriage to produce happiness in their life? That is one of the number one purposes, expectations that people have in marriage. If you were to just take a poll out on the street and say, what do you expect of marriage? What is marriage supposed to produce in your life? Many people would say happiness. Others would talk about, well, it makes me feel complete, feel fulfilled. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying that happiness is a byproduct of marriage, and I'm not discounting that. I'm married, and I'm not saying marriage is bad. I praise God for it. But I am not looking to my marriage to make me happy. In Adam's situation, Adam was already happy. Adam was sinless. He was holy. He was pure. He wasn't deficient. He wasn't a totally depressed, bummed out guy going around until God made him a mate. That wasn't the purpose of marriage. Marriage is not to make you happy. God, your relationship with God is what's given to make you happy. And if you don't understand this and begin to let God start meeting those needs in your life, if you look to your mate and place a demand on them that you fulfill me, you make me happy, I can guarantee you're going to wind up destroying your own marriage. That cannot be your attitude as you approach marriage. You know, I have an example of this. Some very good friends of mine who... Um, I won't use their name, but they are just a, a wonderful couple. They've made a big impact on my life. And I first met them through our radio station in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And this man and woman are uh, just Mr. and Mrs. Perfect. The man, is he was an athlete, he was captain of the team, and he was good-looking, he was all of these kind of things. The woman is just a perfect woman, I mean a beautiful southern belle, all of those kind of things that you look for. And it looked like that their marriage was just one of these perfect marriages. They were both Christians. The man's uh, father was a pastor of a church. And they were both Christians. They both came together believing that God brought them together. But the woman especially had an unrealistic desire towards marriage or an expectation of marriage. She specifically, out of her own testimony, told about how that when she was a child she saw this uh, show of Sleeping Beauty and she fantasized and visualized someday her Prince Charming coming and sweeping her off of her feet and riding off into the sunset. And she said the only problem with that is they never showed what happened after you rode off into the sunset. That's when the real story starts. But see, they gave this impression of marriage just being a perfect thing and she was looking to her husband to just make her happy, to make her complete, to totally do away with all of her depression, to never have another need again. Now, brothers and sisters, there is no person no person that can fulfill that need in your life. Only God is meant to do that. Marriage is not a substitute for a relationship with God. And because this woman didn't realize that, she began to start placing these demands on her husband. And within a year or two, even though he was a good husband, and he really was a good man and loved God, their marriage began to fall apart because she got bitter. She recognized she was still lonely. She was still depressed. She still had problems. And now she was bitter and turning all of this bitterness towards her husband like if you were really the husband you should be, I would not be this depressed. I would not be discouraged and etc. And it began to grow. Her frustration grew to where she was having a mental breakdown and all kinds of things. She got into hate towards her husband. Her bitterness turned towards her husband. And really it wasn't her husband that was the problem. I'm not saying he was sin sinless in the thing, but it wasn't really him that caused this. It was her unrealistic expectations of marriage. And she began to be bitter towards him. He was a pastor of a large church. He was successful in uh, his realm, in his denomination, maybe headed towards the president of that convention and uh, going, blowing. You know, they were having 2,000 people a year born again in that church. And yet here she was full of this bitterness and hatred. And the more he prospered, the worse she got. One time she met him when he came home and threw an entire pot of beans on his head when he walked in the door. Another time she threw a, a whole drawer full of silverware at him and things were just getting worse and worse and worse. And did you know throughout this whole time he tried to walk in love towards her? He tried to be understanding. He was trying to operate towards her the way that Jesus would. And it finally reached a place where this woman was going to commit suicide. She went and bought a gun, tried to kill herself. And it's a long story, but God spoke to her supernaturally turned her life around and turned her attention from her husband to him and let God begin to start fulfilling these voids in her life. And did you know all of a sudden everything turned around? As her relationship with God began to excel, then all of a sudden she became happy and fulfilled and things in that marriage began to work out. Now during this time, 
the woman had actually acted so bad that the man lost his church. He got basically run out of town on a rail. All of his hopes, his success in the ministry had failed. And as a result, now the woman, here she was, happy and joyful, and the man who had been kind to her throughout this whole thing now got bitter because the one who caused him to fail was now happy and prosperous, and it just didn't seem fair to him. So here she was now walking with the Lord and operating in joy, and one time she brought him a cup of coffee, which she hadn't done in the past. She had never served him, and here she was trying to serve her husband, and she offered him a cup of coffee. He took one sip of it, and then he turned around and spit it all back in her face. And she just wiped her face off and says, well, maybe you'd like tea instead of coffee. And she said she walked back into the kitchen and then walked into the bathroom and just screamed to get rid of her frustration. But see, she was walking in love towards him. And then he had to turn around and quit blaming her for all of these things and look into her. And as they both got their relationship with God together, then that marriage has come back together. And I tell you, to be around them, it's nearly embarrassing. They're so sugary sweet towards each other, it's, it's embarrassing to be around them. God restored that marriage. And in that case, which I believe is true of many, many people today, one of the biggest problems in their marriage was that they were looking to each other and to that marriage for fulfillment, for f completeness, for happiness. And that is not the purpose that God created marriage for. God created it for this power that comes in unity. And there's many side effects. There's many benefits, such as the joy that comes from raising a family and having children, and, and on and on it goes. There's many benefits. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, but that cannot be the focus of a marriage. The focus of a marriage is this agreement, this unity. There's a scripture over here in Psalms 133 that I'd like to use, and this is talking about the power of unity. And in Psalms 133, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. And what that's talking about is Aaron was the high priest, and the anointing oil was symbolic of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of God descending. And it says that this dwelling together in unity is like being anointed by God, the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit flowing down upon you. In verse 3 it says, As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. When people come together in unity, God commands His blessing, everlasting life upon them. There's power that's released in unity. And brothers and sisters, that's the reason that God created this mate for Adam, is to actually multiply his effectiveness, to actually duplicate the powers that he had put in him so that he could rule and reign and have dominion and subdue the earth that was upon him. It was a practical union, and of course, yes, it did procreate, it did allow us the ability to reproduce and replenish the earth, but outside of that physical reason there, there was this uh, bonding together, the power that was released in unity. And that's the reason that God created your marriage. Marriage is not for all of these other things that many times we look to it for, but rather marriage is for us to receive this power from God and be able to rule and reign here on this earth, take authority and dominion the way that God intended us to. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, people have missed that. Our society today, Hollywood, I believe, has had a very negative effect on uh, not only the church, but on society as a whole. They've painted totally unrealistic pictures of marriage. They don't show you the problems that actually go on. They don't portray these kind of things. Instead, they present some kind of an emotional response. They've portrayed love as nothing but an emotion, and we'll deal with that more as we get into God's kind of love. But many of us have had our attitudes towards marriage uh, dictated to us or formed through Hollywood. And it just simply is not reality. Many of us are living in a fantasy realm. We're placing expectations and desires on marriage that no marriage can fulfill. I don't care who your mate is. I don't care how holy they are. I don't care who they are. You'll wind up being disappointed if you look to that mate to meet all of your needs. And you'll actually wind up, through putting those kind of demands on them, making them worse. Nobody can live up under that pressure. Nobody can live up to those standards. We've got to start accepting our mate the way that they are. 
Did you know when I deal with people in marriage, I had a friend that taught me this, and when he called married uh, people in, when he counseled with them for marriage, he would have them sit down and he says, do you like the woman the way she is? And the man, oh yes, I love her. And then he'd turn to the woman, do you like the man the way he is? Oh yes, I love him. And then he'd say, well, I want you to know that when you got them, they were okay. And the point that he was making was, years down the road, people come up and say, well, I just can't stand them the way they are. Well, they were okay when you got them. It's not really the people that change in most cases. Rather, it's our attitude towards them. We had an unrealistic expectation. We went into it not really to accept the person the way they are and to love them and help them become what God wants them to be. But we went in there looking to them, placing expectations on them that were totally unrealistic. Many of us approach marriage not with the idea of what can I give to you? How can I be a blessing to you? How can I help fulfill you and make you the mate that God intends you to be? But instead, we approach it like I talk about having a cup, you know, with a soda in it or a shake. We put a straw in that. We suck it out, and when you hear the at the end, then we think, well, this person's no longer any good, and we throw them away and want to go get somebody else. And we've developed that kind of attitude in our society. And it comes from this self-centeredness. We are approaching marriage not trying to give to the other person, not recognizing the true purpose of marriage, the unity, the power that's in that agreement, but instead we've come into it totally self-centered, seeking our own thing, trying to draw from that mate happiness, peace, all of these things that only God was intended to supply. Brothers and sisters, your marriage is supposed to be an extension and an addition, a byproduct of your relationship with God. It is not a substitute for a relationship with God. As we get further into this series and we start talking about God's kind of love and distinguishing it from an earthly love, one of the main points we'll be talking about is that it is not self-seeking, it is not trying to get its own, but rather it's a, it's a giving type of love, like God so loved the world that He gave. If we don't have that God kind of love, if our relationship with God isn't right, if you don't personally draw on God to meet your needs, then I promise you, you are going to be a bad partner in marriage. You are going to wind up being a part of the problem instead of a part of the answer. One of the first things you've got to do is in your own thinking, evaluate and establish, am I really walking with God? Is the Lord supplying my needs? Am I complete in Him like it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10? Is He supplying everything that I need? Is Christ everything I need? Is, am I drawing off of those things or have I substituted my mate? Am I really placing demands upon them? If some of the reasons that you're bummed out is because you and your own self aren't fulfilled through your relationship with the Lord, the very first step, the first thing to do is to get that relationship with the Lord worked out to where you are complete in Him. And marriage no longer is the focus of your strength. It, is, it comes directly from God, and marriage is rather a way of multiplying, increasing that strength, applying that strength, touching other people's lives. But you've got to, first of all, come to a place to where your strength lies completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll make a statement that may sound hard, it may sound like this might be condemning. I don't intend it to be that way. I'm trying to open up our eyes and take our attention away from all of these other things that Satan has occupied us with. But this statement is that your marriage cannot really excel greater than your relationship with God. If you have a sorry relationship with God, you are going to be a sorry partner. And I don't say that to condemn, but I'm saying it to open up our eyes. God never intended marriage to function independent of Him. God didn't intend us to function as two individuals, and God never intended for marriage to work without Him. It's like we read those scriptures over there in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. He says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. God intended marriage to actually be a partnership between three people, God, man, and the woman. He says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder out of Mark chapter 10. God is supposed to be involved in your marriage. God has to complete you. God has to be flowing His life into you and making you complete so that you stand as a complete individual just by you and your relationship with God. Then and only then are you able to really contribute to that marriage and make marriage what it was intended to be. 
Marriage was not intended to provide you with happiness. You know, today, many people are not happy in their marriage. And it's not because marriage fails. It's because they're demanding something of it that it was never intended to give. Happiness, true happiness, true joy only comes from God. There's going to be rough times in your marriage. And if you go into it with an expectation that there's never going to be a problem, then you're going to be disappointed. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, or verse 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And there's some of you that are going to get sick over your marriage, and then you're going to blame the other person like if they were the mate they should be, it wouldn't be this way, when the whole time it was the fact that you had an unrealistic expectation. You need to deal with that, and you need to put your attention totally on the Lord Jesus Christ and let Him be the one that supplies all of your happiness. I'd like to offer you some additional teaching on this subject. I have a cassette tape entitled The Purpose of Marriage. It'll go into a lot more detail than what I was able to on this program today, and I'd like to give this tape to you as a free gift. All you need to do to receive it is write in to me and request our tape offer TM61. That's tape offer TM61. And we'll send this tape to you through the mail. Now, we distribute all of our tapes free of charge. We put out over one and a quarter million tapes now, and we've never denied anybody access to this. But we do encourage people to give as you feel that you can and as the Lord would direct you. So we ask you to pray about it and then respond by giving and helping us continue to reach out and touch other people's lives. That's as for our tape offer, TM61. You can write me, Andrew Womack, at Post Office Box 3333, Colorado Springs, 80934. That's Box 3333, Colorado Springs, 80934. Praise the Lord. I welcome you today to another Gospel Truth broadcast. I'm Andrew Womack, and today we are sharing the second in a series on the subject of marriage. On our first series, as we talked about marriage, we begin to start dealing with the um, purpose that God created marriage for in our life. And we said some things that were very startling, I believe. Uh, most people today really look to marriage to give them happiness, to give them total fulfillment, to give them a sense of completeness. And did you know God didn't create marriage for that purpose? God created marriage for the purpose of multiplying our effectiveness, and we dealt with this. The power that's in unity and in agreement, and we used a lot of scriptures like 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 40, where Paul was talking about a person remaining single, and he says they're happier if they abide single after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of the Lord. So we saw that many people are trying to place a demand on marriage that God never really intended for it to supply. If you are looking to marriage to supply something in your life that only God intended for you to have, then you aren't going to experience uh, fulfillment. You're going to be frustrated, disappointment. You're going to get bitter towards your mate. And this is the reason that a lot of marriages are having problems and failing. And so we begin to start dealing with the fact that you are supposed to have a vital relationship with God. You're supposed to be complete without your mate. You're supposed to be happy without your mate. You're supposed to be... Uh, 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 experience in fellowship with God so that there's not loneliness without your mate. Now, there is happiness and companionship and other things that come, but we cannot place a demand upon our mate that only God was intended to fulfill. God created marriage, and He created it for us so that we could flow with Him. Ma God is intended to be one of the partners in marriage, and we used a scripture out of Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 that talked about that. Now today, I want to begin to start talking about the priority that marriage should occupy in your life. And again, I'd like to go back to Genesis chapter 2 and begin to start reading there. God was the one who created marriage. And as the creator of marriage, God also has a responsibility of telling us how to make our marriage work, or otherwise He would be irresponsible in the thing. God has never given you a command to do anything that He doesn't also provide you with the instruction about how to get it done. Marriages don't fail. Or let me rephrase that. Marriage has not failed. There is nothing wrong with marriage. It's the fact that people fail to take God's instruction and apply it. Marriage is still the institution that God created thousands of years ago. It'll still work the way that it has all throughout history. There's nothing wrong with marriage. It's just that people have not taken God's instruction and applied it to their marriage. So let's look in Genesis chapter 2. This is where God 
uh, created Eve and brought her to Adam. And let's look at what God says right here. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. The very first thing to recognize is that man didn't call out to God for this marriage. He didn't, he didn't call out of some need, out of desperation in his life, and ask God for a mate, and God compromised and said, Well, because of the hardness of your heart, I'll allow you to have a mate. That wasn't the situation. Man didn't ask for anything. Man didn't know what he was missing. God created marriage for a sinless, perfect man. And I believe that that's important today because there's an attitude that's developed in our society where people actually look at marriage as a crutch. Many people will look at it as uh, something that you do for a, a person who's got all of these problems in their life and they just need all of these emotional benefits. Adam didn't have any inadequacies in his life. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't desperate. He was sinless. He was pure. He was having fellowship with God. There was nothing wrong with Adam. God picked marriage. God instituted marriage. In that sense, marriage really is holy matrimony. And it's important that you begin to recognize it as something valuable that God has given you. Did you know that the church, as much as I believe in the church today, the church is, is vital. The church is really the central figure around what God operates through today. I'm not belittling the church at all, but did you know that the church actually is a result of the fall? If there hadn't have been a fall, if sin hadn't entered into the world, and if there didn't have to be a called-out group, if everybody was still sinless, there would be no such thing as the church as we know it today. The church is actually a byproduct of the fallen race. It was something that God had to put in the earth to counter the negative influence that Satan and his kingdom was doing. Did you know government? The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 13 and other places about government, that we're supposed to obey the government authorities and that God put them there, that they are ministers of God to us for good. I believe in government, but did you know that government is a byproduct of sin? All of those things, if sin hadn't entered into the world, there wouldn't be a need for those things. As important as they are, they actually are something that God never originally intended to be a part of the human race. So when you look at it in that light, Marriage, even, it elevates the priority of marriage because God gave marriage to us when we were in a sinless state. It's one of the very few things that has been preserved and came through the fall on down to us today. God actually has given us an institution that was meant for sinless, pure man, and he allows us to still operate in that today. So that is a tremendous statement. Marriage is something that God created and gave to us, and it really is holy. If you begin to put that kind of value on it, well, then you'll treat it differently. A lot of marriages are failing because they simply aren't putting the effort into it. We treat it like something that we can just discard. We've got an attitude today about divorce, and we say, well, you know, if I don't like them, I'll go get me another one. You know, my dad died when I was only 12 years old. And uh, so before I got married, I was down visiting my relatives in East Texas, and I've got an uncle uh, that I call Uncle Safi, and I remember that this uncle took me aside and he was giving me a little bit of fatherly advice and he told me, he says, boy, this isn't Sears and Roebuck. If you don't like her, you can't bring her back. And what he was trying to say was that, you know, this is a commitment. You need to recognize that you just can't throw this away. This is forever until death do you part. Well, a lot of people have lost that perspective on marriage, and because of it, they actually have marriages today where people uh, write out contracts and decide what they're going to do with their assets if a divorce was to come about. And they decide ways that they will get rid of that in case of that happening. Now, if you're planning for that, if you have plan B or if you have plan C, I can guarantee you that you're going to be pushed to that limit. You shouldn't have that attitude when you enter into marriage. It's a commitment. We need to put a value on it and recognize that it's something valuable and you just can't separate yourself and, and act like nothing happened and just go on. Now, if you've already done that, I'm not trying to minister condemnation, but I am saying that we are not putting the priority on marriage that we should have. You know, if I had something worth $1,000, I wouldn't leave it on the seat of my car and just go off and leave the car unlocked. If I have something that's worth maybe a dollar or something, you know, I, I might do that. Because, see, the value that you place on something directly depends on the way that you're going to protect it and on the way that you are going to uh, keep other people, you know, from coming against it. So the value that we place on marriage really depends, or it determines a lot, the effort that we're going to put into it. We need to recognize that according to this scripture, it's something that God saw for you that was good for you. 
It is something that God gave to a sinless man. And if a sinless man, if it wasn't good for him to be alone, then I guarantee you it's not good for you to be alone. God has given us something precious here and we need to begin to start uh, elevating marriage and putting the priority on it that God gave to it. In Genesis 2, 19, it says, after he had already told uh, Adam that it wasn't good for him to be alone, I'll make a help meet for you. Then in verse 19 and 20, he made all of the animals, all of the cattle, the birds that fly, all of these things, and then he brought them to Adam to see what Adam would call them. Now, you know, if you look at this on the surface, it looks like that God says, Adam, you need a help me, and so I'm going to create one for you. And then God goes out, creates all of the animals, and brings them to Adam, seeing if any of these animals would supply his need. Now, you know, if you think about it, I believe that, uh, and I'm saying this uh, in a funny way, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I believe that God was sharp enough to know that no giraffe was ever going to supply my need, that no elephant was ever going to minister to me, or no hippo was ever going to be a proper mate for me. I believe that God knew that. And so if all of that's so, if God knew these things, then why did God say, Adam, you need to help me. I'm going to create these things and bring them before Adam. I believe that even though God knew that there was nothing else in all of creation that could supply the need that he had, I don't believe that Adam knew that. Or there was a possibility of after he enters into the relationship and things begin to go wrong, Satan is a master at coming to us and saying, boy, you got a bum deal. You know this mate, you just got a bum mate. Now I know that some of you listening right now have probably had the devil come at you and do those exact same things. There's probably some of you that at one time were real excited about your marriage, had high hopes, and as you begin to start experiencing things that don't look the way that you had planned, you didn't intend on it going this way, then you begin to start entertaining thoughts, well, maybe I got the wrong one. You know, maybe something else would satisfy. Or, lots of times, people will start substituting other things in their life. If their marriage isn't productive and producing and really ministering to them the way that they desire for it to, then many people will put themselves, like for instance men, will throw themselves into a job. And they'll try and gain emotional satisfaction through performing a job. And the uh, credit that they get, the pat on the backs, uh, they will use that to supply a need in their life that that marriage was actually meant to do. Uh, lots of times people will put themselves into sports and into leisure. I know that uh, there's a woman in our church that uh, talked to me about her husband and that he had pre-hunting syndrome is what she called it said he'd just sit on the front porch and stare off into space and think about going hunting. And she said she just loses him as a husband during the hunting season. Well, see, that's not a proper priority. I believe that there are people that have actually substituted things in their life for the purpose that God created marriage for, this power, this unity that God intended marriage to be in our life. And so I believe that that's the reason that God brought these animals to Adam, is to show him that, Adam, there is nothing in all of creation that is suited for you. I'm going to have to make a brand new creation, something special just for you. And what it would do is take away any doubt in the future that God maybe didn't uh, take the proper mate and give to him. This was something that God created special for Adam. Marriage was something that God came up with, and then he made something that had never existed before, something very special just for Adam. And I believe that the reason he brought these animals is to convince Adam that this is what you need. And it's important today that we recognize that. In verse 21, it says that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now again, the terminology here I believe is critical. Because see, God didn't just take a rib out of man and then from that rib build some things around it and build another person out of it. The terminology here says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. I believe that literally out of that substance, out of that one rib that he took out of Adam, that he literally multiplied those atoms, those molecules, and made an entire person out of it. Now the importance of this is it stresses the unity between man and woman. Woman wasn't just a little bit like man. She didn't just have one rib in her that was uh, similar to man, and in that sense they shared something in common. But literally, that woman was a product of that man. That woman was that man just simply multiplied and reshaped. It was a total projection of him. In that sense, they were one. They were not two people, but they were one. What this does, it stresses the unity that happened in this marriage. 
Now somebody might think, now wait a minute, how can God take a rib and out of one rib build an entire skeleton and then flesh and all of these other things that's needed? Well, how can God create a person in the first place? I don't know how God did it. I don't know how God took five loaves and two fish, fed 5,000 men, and then had more left over than when he started. I don't know how God does that stuff, but he comes by it honest. Amen. I guarantee you that this scripture is saying that God took that one rib and made an entire person out of it. Eve was not just a little bit in common with Adam. She was literally Adam duplicated, multiplied over here. Now there's a scripture that bear this out over in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. The scripture here says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him male and female. Now notice the terminology here. It says male and female. That's talking about two people. Created he them, that's plural, and bless them, that's plural, and call their name, that's a plural, their name Adam, singular. God, speaking about two individuals, called them Adam. Did you know that God did not call Eve, Eve? The scripture says over there in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam is the one who named Eve. But when God was referring to Adam's mate, he called her Adam. He looked at them as being one person. Now that's awesome. Now God is the one that has the true perspective on things. And when God looks at your mate and calls her by your name, that's because in God's sight, you are one. Did you know that we still have some trappings of this that have come down through customs, and lots of times we don't understand what these customs are. But did you know that when a woman gets married, she loses her maiden name and takes on the name of her husband? Like my wife was Jamie Harris, but now she's Jamie Womack. And what she did was literally lose her identity to become one with me. And in God's sight, we are one person. God would call us Womack, not Andrew and Jamie. And so, see, that's the way that God deals with us. God sees us as one. And then under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, going back to Genesis chapter 2, this is what Adam said after he woke up and saw Eve. It says in verse 23 that Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now this is Adam speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Adam didn't have a father or a mother to leave. So he wasn't saying this out of his own experience. This wasn't his natural wisdom. But rather this was inspiration by God. He was saying that for this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now very few people, I believe, have really seen the union that takes place between a man and a woman. And again, because of a lack of understanding of this, then we simply don't place the value on marriage that we should. We allow Satan to tear apart that union and we don't fight for it. We don't defend it. We don't put the priority on it that God intended us to have. When my wife teaches on this subject, I've seen her before take two, picture, two uh, pages of a Bible like this and uh, say, if you were to glue these two pages together, that would form a bond here. Now, this is not a perfect parallel because this bond is nothing near as complete as what actually happens between a man and his wife. But if you could just imagine gluing two pages of a Bible together like this, letting it dry and set, and then trying to separate them, you may separate them, but you'll never come out with two whole pages. And you know, this is what happens when a man and a wife come together, they become one flesh according to this scripture and also Mark chapter 10 talks about this. There's a union that takes place that we don't understand. We, uh, if we were looking at things from a natural perspective, we would value the relationship between a parent and child actually as being a stronger relationship than between a husband and a wife because here comes the wife and the husband joined together and maybe they haven't even known each other, haven't been a part of each other's life for 20 years and then they come together in some kind of a union. But we can see a direct relationship between a parent and a child where like with a woman, that child literally came out of her body. It's easy to see that relationship and yet under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Adam is saying that the relationship between a, a husband and wife is greater than that of parent and child. Now that's the importance. That's the unity that comes. And you, if you break that apart, divorce, uh, in some, I'm not teaching on divorce, I'm not trying to condemn or condone or any of that, but I'm saying that at, at the very best, divorce never allows two whole individuals to come out of there. It destroys people's lives. 
And that's the reason that God said in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, that He hates divorce. Not because He hates you if you've gotten a divorce. God hates divorce because of what it does to people. We have not understood the oneness, the unity that happens between a man and his wife. And because of it, we simply look at it as kind of some kind of a cooperation. Many people will say, well, marriage is a 50-50 proposition where you have to give and also take. But it's really not. It is a total commitment of yourself to that person. You literally become one with them, and you can't just break off that relationship. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't seen marriage in this light, if you haven't put this kind of priority on it, then I can promise you that you are not going to experience the full benefit of marriage because we've got to understand that that marriage is a relationship that God gave us where we literally become one flesh with that person to the point that God, when He looks at you, doesn't see you as two individuals, but He sees you as one individual. You have an authority to pray for your mate that you couldn't ever experience in praying for someone else. God has given you a control, an inroad, a part of that person's life to where you literally become one person. And one of the reasons that marriages are having problems today is because we've got so many things in our society that have come against marriages to divide them and to take away this oneness. The ERA movement, which I call the E Rules Adam movement today, has come up with all of these things for women that actually is dividing the home, putting the husband and wife in two total different directions. Our lives are becoming more and more and more independent of each other and in a very subtle way, most people don't recognize it, but each one of these steps, every way that you divide the relationship to where the husband has this career and the wife has this career, the husband has a different set of friends, we've got different bank accounts, uh, women no longer are adopting the husband's name, and uh, there could be multiple reasons for that, but many times it's, it's in preparation for divorce, anticipating problems, still retaining things in a maiden name. It's just another way of separating yourselves, not recognizing total identity, total union with your mate. That is not a positive way to make a relationship work. God wants our relationship, our marriage, to be a total merger to where you literally become one brand new person, the merger of the two of you. When my wife and I got married, we came together in a very supernatural fashion, and we were engaged to be married before we ever held hands. And I'm not saying that that's the way it has to be with everybody, but I mean, it wasn't, I didn't go out and pick my wife and say, this is one that I think I'd like, and then go to God and say, God, is this the one you want for me? God put us together. And when we came together, uh, I literally, something happened on the inside of me. I remember right after our marriage, uh, I just had a totally different attitude. All of a sudden, God began to turn my life uh, in a different direction, and I literally became a, like a brand new person. Jamie and I together became a new individual. It wasn't me continuing in my lifestyle, and now I had another person that I was trying to cooperate with, and it was the same thing from my wife's standpoint. We weren't two different people now trying to go in a mutual direction, but when we came together, we had this concept about the unity, about the oneness that God had given us. And as a result, we literally became one brand new person. We began to start functioning as a new individual. Now, I really believe that that is the way that God wants a marriage to work. Instead of two people trying to go in a mutual direction, we literally need to become one brand new identity. Now, I know I'm speaking what is ideal, and there's many of you that have already got a situation that is so far removed from that you wonder if it's possible, but I believe that that is exactly what God desires for you. And in the spirit realm, see, this has already taken place. It's already a reality. There's a union that takes place whether you understand this or not. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, there's a scripture that says, uh, He that is joined unto a harlot is one flesh. And then it goes on to say, but we are joined unto the Lord and we become one spirit with the Lord. And this is not the main point of that scripture, but in, in passing, what he's doing is saying that even in a relationship where it's like an adulterous relationship where you're going into a harlot, there still is this one flesh. There is a unity that takes place. So it doesn't have to necessarily be acknowledged. It doesn't have to have faith released for the transaction to take place on the inside. But to receive the benefit of it and to make it work to its fullest extent, you do have to believe. So the point that I'm making is that whether you acknowledge it or not, you may not see unity in your marriage. You may think that, boy, we're as different as we can be. Strife has divided us. There's no unity or anything. And yet God has made you one with that other person. 
There is a unity, just exactly as we can see here with Adam and Eve, the way they came together and became one brand new person. The same thing has taken place with you if you've entered into a marriage relationship. There is a unity. And so rather than feeling that this is unobtainable, rather than feeling that this is something that I don't know if it'll work in our marriage, what you need to do is recognize it's already happened and just begin to start taking advantage of it and putting your faith in it. Now, there's much more that we're going to say about this as we continue on to deal with this. We'll be dealing in another subject, talking about some of the things that come against our marriages to divide this unity. But this point that we're making here, I want you to remember that God looked at Adam and Eve and God didn't call them Adam and Eve. He called them Adam. He called two people by one name because in God's sight, they were one. God has put you together with a mate. There is a unity that's taken place. And if you would just get that concept, if you would do what we've talked about on this broadcast, and if you would just simply take the priority that God intended marriage to occupy in your life and begin to say, God, this is something holy. It was something that you gave to a sinless man. It was something that was for man in a perfect, sinless state. And you've given it to me. If you would begin to evaluate it like that. And then if you would look at your mate and recognize that God didn't intend you to function independent of each other and not even just in cooperation with each other, but God intended you to function as a brand new person. As a brand new person. If you could understand that and then begin to start operating in cooperation with what God is saying right here in these scriptures... I guarantee it would revolutionize your life. Uh, the same principle is used once again over in Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll be using that as we go through this series. But in Ephesians chapter 5, the scripture over there talks about a man loving his wife, even as Christ loved the church. And then it says, no man ever yet hated his own body. And then he's, he makes the comparison. Because you don't hate your own body, well, then you shouldn't hate your wife because your wife literally has become a part of you. There is a union there. Paul is using the exact same uh, terminology, the same reasoning that I'm using with you today, and that is that you need to recognize that your wife is not a separate individual, but your wife literally has become united with you. There is a union there, and we must learn how to function as a unit. We must get into that a unity and into that agreement that is actually the purpose, the entire purpose of marriage, and that ought to be the goal of it. That ought to be where we're headed towards. Now, there's many things that come against that. We're going to continue to deal with this. There's so much more material on this. But I, I encourage you not to pass over the importance of the things that we've said today. I believe that this is a critical problem that people are having in marriages because they simply aren't esteeming uh, putting the priority on marriage that God intended it to have. And if that's the case with you today, then I encourage you to just humble yourself and right now say, Father, I want you to open up my heart and show me, reveal to me exactly how important this marriage is. Forgive me for not putting the priority on it that you've placed on it. And as you do that, I tell you, God is going to do a work in you and also a work in your marriage. Praise the Lord. I'd like to give you an opportunity to receive some further ministry on the priority of marriage, the subject that we were dealing with today. I have an audio cassette that deals with this subject. It's entitled The Priority of Marriage, and you can have a copy of that free of charge by simply writing in to me and requesting our tape offer TF9. That's tape offer TF9. If you'd like to receive a copy of that, we'll send it to you through the mail free and postpaid. We put out over one and a quarter million cassette tapes free of charge, and there's no gimmicks to this. We'll be glad to send it to you. For those of you who can give and help support this ministry, then we would appreciate it. That's the way that God meets our needs, and also that's God's system of blessing you. So write in and request this tape offer, TF9. You can write to me, Andrew Womack, Post Office, Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. Praise the Lord. This is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you've joined me for another Gospel Truth broadcast. Today we're doing the third in a series on the subject of marriage. And we've already covered quite a bit of material. And just real briefly as a way of review, I'd like to say that we've started out of Genesis chapter 2. We've started talking about marriage. And first of all, we dealt with what the purpose of marriage was, which really was a uh, revelation to me because I know that uh, myself, like a lot of people, thought that marriage was for the purpose of producing happiness in my life, making me complete, 
and on and on the list goes. Well, really, the main purpose of marriage was, of course, procreation, but then beyond that, it was to provide us with the agreement, and we dealt with that. It is not for the purpose of happiness, and if you try and use marriage to accomplish something that God didn't intend it to, well, then you aren't going to get the right results. And many people have simply been substituting what God intended a relationship with Him to produce, and they've been trying to place those kind of demands on a marriage, which, of course, cannot work. Nobody can meet that standard. So we started off talking about what the purpose of marriage was. And then on our last teaching, we were dealing with the priority of marriage. What kind of priority should it occupy? And we've been taking our teaching out of Genesis chapter 2. This is where the Lord created marriage. He's the one that instituted it. And so that right there shows us that it should occupy a very high priority. This is not something that man asked for, but rather it's something that God looked at a sinless man and said, you need this. And then God created him a special mate, somebody that was completely different from the rest of creation. This, there was nothing else in creation that could supply this need. And so God made him somebody that was in his own likeness, in his own image, literally an extension of himself. And we dealt with that on our program last time. And we were even sharing that this woman not only had just physically... Adam in her, or she wasn't only physically a part of Adam, but emotionally she was a part of Adam. They shared a lot of things so that no longer were they two separate independent beings, but they had literally become one interdependent upon each other. Now, if that kind of attitude is not present in a marriage, that's one reason that marriages don't succeed. This idea of a 50-50 proposition will not work. You've got to commit yourself 100% to that other person and likewise have them commit themselves unto you to make marriage work. And that's what we've been dealing with. I'd like to continue to deal here out of Genesis chapter 2 and just share some more things with you concerning the priority of marriage. There's so much more that I believe needs to be said on this, especially in our day and time. You know, this attitude, I think I mentioned this, that the uh, ERA... Uh, amendment and that attitude that it is produced is even pushed over into the Christian realm, that Eve rules Adam attitude to where there is a changing of roles. And we're now seeing a lot of changes come through society and it's having an impact even on Christian marriages. And so we've got to go back to God's Word and make sure that the values established in God's Word are still what we are basing our marriages upon. And so let's just look here in Genesis chapter 2 at some things that Adam said. This is right after God made woman and brought her unto the man. And it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now this is talking about relationships. And I've heard some people say that this is uh, like a narrative. This wasn't Adam speaking, but rather this was Moses, the writer of Genesis, saying that a man should leave his father and mother. I've always looked at this as being Adam speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost about a man leaving his father and mother when he didn't even have a father or mother. That would just underscore that it was really the inspiration of God, not experience that was talking. Either way, it doesn't matter. The point that's being made is that the relationship between a man and his wife should supersede all other relationships. Now, on the surface, I believe that most people would agree with that, but you know, in practice, that's not really the way it works. I deal with a lot of people, and I've pastored three different churches, and in the process of pastoring these churches, I've had a lot of people come to me with different problems. And did you know that this problem of an in-law in marriage, the problems that that cause, uh, causes, has uh, been one of the main problems that I've dealt with throughout the years? We also have these marriage seminars that we put on during the year, and we have questionnaires that we have people fill out. And we rate different things on there and ask them for problems. And did you know that we have in there a relationship with in-laws, and we rate it from 1 to 10, 10 being bad, 1 being good. And did you know that in the majority of spirit-filled marriages, there still is a problem with in-laws? And it's a problem. It, it puts strain on a marriage. You know, I've had an example, and I won't go into details on this just because we need to move on and cover time. But I've actually had two major examples that I could give of people who were having problems physically. One of them was physically sick, and another one was having a lot of marriage problems. And as I began to deal with them and talk to them, really the inroad of that was coming through an in-law, that they had never broken this dominance that, they, that their parents had had over them. 
And that's not totally wrong because, I mean, they were trying to honor their parents. But you've got to do what the Word says right here, where you leave your father and mother and cleave unto your wife. That means that no relationship comes beyond or comes before that relationship of husband and wife. And a failure to live by this has actually caused Satan to have inroad into that marriage. I tell you, marriages have enough problems without us adding to it. It's hard for a man and a woman to get along and to begin to start really cooperating and flowing as one. And so we just don't need any excess baggage. The Lord here is saying that no other relationship should take priority. Marriage should have number one priority in our life. You know, I minister also to a lot of ministers, and I minister on the subject of marriage. And one of the things I find constantly that occurs in ministers is that they are giving a priority to the ministry and to ministering to other people, and they let their family go by the wayside. Now, it's not intentional, but I mean most people don't differentiate between their relationship with God and even their relationship to the church, or in a minister's case, to a ministry. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that wouldn't dare put in 60 or 70 hours a week on a job because they'd think that job just isn't worth it. I've got to give time to my family. And yet a minister will put in 80 hours a week very easily and let his family take back seat. I remember one minister had a vacation plan, the first one they had taken in years. And as they were leaving the house, he got a phone call. Somebody in their church had died and he had to go minister to them. They canceled their vacation because of the needs of the people in his church. And we just simply need to recognize that it doesn't matter if you're a minister. It doesn't matter how noble your cause is. Even if it's ministering to other people, you've got to put the relationship between you and your wife and then your children even above that ministry. The same thing is true of jobs, that a job cannot take precedent. If you've got a job that is taking you away from your family, I've known some people that actually had to go live away from their family months or weeks at a time, and then they expect their family to prosper. Well, that's not the way it works. And I understand that sometimes, you know, in a crisis situation, for a brief period of time, you may be able to do something like that, but you cannot keep it as a, a lifestyle. We, what this is saying is that the marriage relationship has to occupy the highest priority, I believe, only below our relationship directly with God. You've got to put that kind of a priority on it so that literally friends, relatives, jobs, Anything else that comes along, nothing preempts that relationship that you have with your mate. Now, failure to do this is causing a lot of problems in marriage, and we could go nearly indefinitely on this. One of the things that I'd like to point out, and I'm, I'm doing this not really because I'm trying to pick on a certain area, but I believe that one of the greatest inroads that Satan has made to divide this oneness in the marriage and putting a priority on your relationship with your mate, one of the biggest ways that he's done this and has been basically undetected, has been in the area of the roles of the husband and the wife. Uh, anybody that's been paying attention recognizes that over the last 50 years, there's been nearly a complete reversal uh, in the uh, traditional American family. We've now got uh, our standard of living is up so high that many people are having to both husband and wife work, sometimes more than one job, and it's putting strain on the home. Now, I'm not here to condemn, and I'm not here to tell every single individual that you've got to be exactly this way because there can be different circumstances. Uh, we have, for one thing, more single parents uh, running a home than has ever happened in the history of the world, as far as I know, certainly in the history of this nation. And so in a situation like that, you may have to do something else. But it is not God's ideal situation. I believe that those of you that are in that situation would agree with that. And it causes problems and pressures on the home. And there are many of you who are listening to me that it may be by choice that you've chosen to change, that no longer do we have the church standing here saying that this is the traditional home, this is the way God ordained it to be. Uh, really, the church has, has gotten away from absolutes saying that this is the way God intended it to be and everything's becoming relative and it leaves it open for people to just adjust and pick and choose what they want to be. But that's not the way that God intended it. There are some statements in the Word of God that show us that uh, a traditional home, as we've uh, come to know it in the past, is the way that God intended it to be. Let me share a scripture with you out of 1 Timothy chapter 5. And this scripture is talking about the ministry to the widows in the church. But in the process, he's saying that the widows shouldn't be uh, charged to the church unless they don't have any relatives at home that can take care of them so that the church would be free to take care of the people who are widows indeed. 
And it says this in the process of explaining all this in verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house. Now this is talking about like a nephew or a son providing for parents. But then it goes on, especially for those of his own house. He is worse than an infidel and hath denied the faith. Now that's a strong statement, and that's saying that if he is not financially responsible for his own, especially those in his own house, he's worse than an infidel. That means he's worse than a lost man. He's denied the faith. You know, this is a tremendously strong statement that Paul made here, and most of us today, most of the church today hasn't put this same emphasis on the man being the provider for the home. And because of it, we've now got to where we have actually Usually, in a lot of cases, the husband and the wife having the burden and the responsibility of providing for the home. Let me share one other scripture on this out of Titus chapter 2. And in Titus chapter 2, it's giving commandments to the older men and also to the older women. And in verse 4, it says that the older women are supposed to teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And this scripture says that a woman has been given the responsibility of being a keeper at home and guiding the house. Now that is not to say that a woman cannot work. And I'm not saying that you're living in sin. I'm not saying any of those things. But I'm saying in God's best situation, the best possible circumstances, God gave the man the responsibility of providing for the home and God gave the woman the responsibility of guiding the home and staying there and giving direction to the children, etc. Now again, there's cooperation. The man uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about fathers provoke not your children but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So that scripture talks about the husband having a role in the training of the children. I'm not saying that the woman has that total responsibility. I'm not saying that a man has to just bring in every penny that's ever produced in the home. You could go to Proverbs chapter 31 where it talks about a virtuous woman. And that virtuous woman, she went out and she bought a field. She was involved in real estate. She made garments. She was up early, stayed up late. She had maidens working for her and she produced income for the home. But if you'd really study Proverbs 31, she did it in a way that she never was really away from the home. She didn't give her direction of the children to someone else, but she, her main priority was to that home. And so I think that that's what I'm saying is that the man has the main priority, the responsibility for being the provider. The woman has the responsibility for guiding the home. And I believe that God set it up that way for a number of different reasons. Let me just say this, that you know in our world there's pressures that come upon you as you're out in the world making a living. And I believe that every person listening to me can understand that. And if you take the man and put him into a situation where, I mean, he goes to work, he's battling these pressures, he has his boss maybe say things to him, he runs into relationship problems with other people, he experiences all of these things. When he comes home, he wants to just sit down, relax, put these things behind him, and he needs to be ministered to. Now, if you take the woman who God created to be in the home and to minister to that home. And again, going back to those scriptures we started with in Genesis chapter 2, the woman was given to the man to be a help to him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the scripture there says that the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. She was created specifically to help him and to be sufficient, help him to be everything that God wants him to be. Now, that's the way God intended it to be. But if you put the woman out there in the same work world as the man is in, under the same pressures, and let me add a little parenthesis to this. I'll be right back to my point. Don't forget where I'm going. But if you put a woman in that situation, the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that the woman is a weaker vessel. Now, that doesn't mean that she's... That's not, I don't believe, talking about only physically that she may not be able to lift as much. It's not talking about that she's inferior or any of these kind of things. She's different. God made a woman to be soft, to be kind, to be sensitive. In a lot of ways, a woman is not able to take criticism and pressures the same way that a man is. And some people may debate that. They may argue that point. But I believe that that's exactly what the Scripture is talking about. There's a difference between men and women. And it's not only physical. Emotionally, there's a difference. And God really created the woman for a different purpose than to be out there providing the living. And we can see that from the Scriptures that we've already used. So the man is actually more capable, more equipped to be out there facing all of these pressures. The woman was meant to be at home. And so you take that situation, you put the woman into a pressure situation, she comes home. 
this woman is just as wasted, just as much, uh, you know, under pressure as the man has ever thought about being. And actually, I believe probably those pressures impact her more. You put her in that situation, she comes home, the man is totally wrung out, he comes home, wants to just sit and relax, and yet, in most homes, the woman is now expected to come up with supper, and then after supper to wash the dishes, and then to take care of the kids, make sure their baths are done, and on and on it goes. And so the woman works, is just as neat in need of ministry as the man is, and yet here, when she comes home, there's just more and more demands placed on her. And I tell you, that's just like a stick of dynamite. It's just a matter of time until it explodes. And those of you that have been in that situation, I believe that without exception, those of you that have both uh, mates working and providing a living have probably at some time or another had words over the fact, well, why don't you help? Why don't you do this? I've been out working and doing the same things that you have. And so, brothers and sisters, this is not really the setup that God intended for marriage. I believe that the ideal situation that God has for marriage is that the man go out and provide the living and then the woman be at home guiding the house, taking care of the house. Again, let me put a parenthesis in here. ERA has come across and in an effort to motivate women to get out there and, and make something of their lives has put down staying at home to such a degree that there are many of you, even Christian women, who would think of being at home as, man, what a waste of my time. I'm doing nothing, just sitting there watching soap operas all day. You mean that's what God wants me to do? Well, I can guarantee you, God doesn't want you to stay home and watch soap operas all day. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, if you truly give direction to your house and take it as a ministry and minister to your home, I guarantee you, it is a full-time job. My wife keeps a good house. And I guarantee you, my wife is busy constantly. I don't believe that you can rear children, if you, have, if you have children still in the home, and take care of the home and do it in a godly fashion and have a lot of spare time on your hands. But you can do it in a controlled environment where you're able to play tapes, listen to the Word, be built up, pray for your husband, and then when he comes home, instead of you being drained and, and there being a collision of personalities, you can be there to minister and to build up your mate and I tell you, it would, it would make a tremendous difference in that home. Many of you, this may seem strange to you, but I can tell you from a husband's standpoint that a woman can minister to a man by being in that home and ministering to him in a way that many of you have never recognized. Again, a man is not a real good communicator, and he may not show his appreciation for it, but I guarantee you they can tell the difference when you aren't there to minister to them. You know, I'm a minister... I've got all of my staff working for me, and uh, some people think that there's no pressures on me, but I've got 26 people working for me, and any time you have 26 people, I guarantee you, you've got problems. You've got personality problems. I've got financial problems. And there's some times that I go to my office, and when I come home, I mean I am praying in tongues, 90 to nothing, trying to get the problems off of me. And there's been times that I've walked in, and Jamie has been at home. She's been fixing for me, fixing food, baking or doing something. She comes up and greets me. And because she is spiritually built up and encouraged, I tell you, that has done more for me sometimes than five or six hours worth of prayer and Bible study could do. And those of you that have ever been in that situation, I believe, can relate to that. A woman has a tremendous potential to minister to her husband that I think that a lot of women have been talked out of. We don't recognize it. Over in the 8th chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus came into Peter's house and ministered to his mother-in-law. And it says that he rebuked the fever. The fever left her. She got up and ministered to him. Now, that doesn't mean that she had Jesus sit in a chair and preached at him for 30 minutes. That means that she got up and fixed his food, that she washed his feet. She did those kind of duties that a woman in the home was doing. And the Bible calls it a ministry. I tell you, women, it's a ministry to minister to your husband and to minister to your children. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only ministry that you can have. I've got women on my staff that work for me, but we constantly try and put it into pr perspective and make sure that they maintain the priority of their home first. You may be able to do other things, but you will never do anything that is more important than ministering to your husband and ministering to your children. Men, you may have other responsibilities, but don't ever let that job begin to start taking the place that God intended that home to have. I believe that that's what these scriptures in Genesis chapter 2 are all about when he says, forsake your father and mother and cleave unto your wife. You know, probably one of the best examples we have of this is over in John chapter 2, and I believe it's verse 4. And this is where Jesus was at the marriage feast in the land of Canaan. 
or in the town of Canaan, and it was where he turned the water into wine. And even though Jesus wasn't married, he was going through this process of breaking away from the dominion of his mother. And she came to him trying to place the demand upon him. And you know, he said unto her, he says, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. Now that term woman is not necessarily a derogatory term, but I mean it's, it's really not an affectionate term. It's something that you wouldn't expect Jesus to say to his mother. And yet what he was trying to do was to distance himself as no longer being her child under her dominion, under her control. He had to be about his father's business. He even said that when he was 12 years old, but because he was still 12, he submitted himself unto his parents and went home with them. But here he is, 30 years old, beginning his ministry, and his mother is still trying to exert influence. And, you know, I can understand that uh, because as you raise a child, that at one time that child was so dependent upon you that it's easy to just get in a mindset, in a mode that it's hard for you to see them as grown, as being independent of you. And yet that's what the Scripture says it should be. Actually, the final um, act of a parent, the final responsibility that a parent has to its child is to cut that umbilical cord for their child, to tell them that I love you, I'll be here as a brother or a sister in the Lord, to help you any way that I can, but as far as me being responsible for you, you being dependent upon me, you now need to cleave unto that mate and make your relationship to God and your relationship to your mate the thing that sustains you. Now that's the way that God intends for it to be. And parents, we need to deal with our children and train them in that direction. Children, if you're already in that situation and you recognize that your parents are having a, an undue influence on you, like for instance, if God was to speak to you today and call you to be a missionary to go to Africa, and if one of your first responses was, what are my parents going to say? How could I ever convince them? What about the grandkids? What would they say about not being able to see them? Now, I don't think it's totally wrong to have that as a consideration, but if it becomes an obstacle to you, something that you say, how could we ever do this? Look what their response would be. Well, then they're having a dominance in your life, and it needs to be broken. I could literally give you a couple of examples where I prayed with people over the influence that other relationships, usually parent-child, but it could even be other relationships, I've prayed with people about that, and as they've just made a decision inwardly that no longer am I going to let what they think dominate me. It's going to be what God thinks plus what my mate and I agree on. As those people have made that decision, I have literally seen healing come unto people. One guy that was sick and in the hospital, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge that he was having a relationship problem like this. And as he dealt with it, God set him free physically. The same thing happens through work and through a lot of other different things that we allow other relationships to complicate this marriage relationship. What the Lord is saying through all of this is that your marriage should occupy the number one place in your life outside of your personal relationship with God. If you're a minister in ministry, you need to put your family above that church. You know, we make jokes about preacher's kids, and the reason preacher's kids have turned out so bad and we've had so many problems with them is because parents have literally neglected their children in an effort to reach other people. That's not what God called me to do. When I stand before God, I'm going to give an answer, first of all, for my relationship with God, then a relationship with my wife, then my relationship to my children, and then ultimately the fulfillment of the ministry that God's given me. If I have to lose my family to reach you, then I'd quit this ministry or at least I'd take a sabbatical and get my family straightened out before I'm going to sit there and sacrifice my family. I believe that that's God's system of priority, even for a minister and also for you. The same thing is true of jobs. The same thing is true of everything else. You know, it may be that you say, well, our family's kind of pulled in two different directions. My wife has her career. I've got mine. She's got her set of friends. I've got my set of friends. She's got her bank account. I've got mine. All of these things are breaking this unity and this priority that we're supposed to be putting on marriage. And you say, but how could we live without it? Well, brothers and sisters, if it was really important to you, you could make a decision that I don't have to have three cars for two people driving in the family. We don't have to have a $100,000 house. We don't have to have brand new televisions. We don't have to have VCRs. We don't have to have all of these things. If it came down to it, you could decrease your lifestyle to exalt God's Word over your family. But whatever you've got to do, you need to make a decision that God's Word needs to begin to dominate. And one of the things that we've been teaching from this series is to say that marriage is supposed to have priority 
in your life right below your personal relationship with God. If that's not so in your life, then right now what you need to do is make a decision and say, God, I want to exalt marriage and really put the priority on it that you intended it to have. And if you don't know exactly how to do that, then humble yourself and say, God, show me. Show me areas in my life where I am not giving the priority to my wife or to my children. Show me things that have come into my life that are stealing away the life of God. And if you'll do that, I guarantee you that God will begin to reveal himself to you and he'll show you how to put the priority on your marriage that God intended for you to have. And as you do it, you'll be blessed in your marriage. I'd like to offer you a cassette tape on this same subject that I dealt with on our program today, and it's entitled The Priority of Marriage, Part 2. And it'll deal specifically with what we were talking about, the relationships. Uh, nothing can supersede our relationship with our mate. There's a lot of things on here that could really bless you, so I encourage you to write in and request this. It's our tape offer, TF10. That's tape offer, TF10. It's available to you free of charge, but if you can send an offering to help us with the price of this, it would be appreciated. Remember when you write in to request it by this number, TF10, and we'll send you this tape on the priority of marriage, the subject that we dealt with on our program today. Praise the Lord. I'm Andrew Womack, and I welcome you to our Gospel Truth broadcast. On this teaching, we are going to continue our series that we began four weeks ago talking about marriage. We're dealing with the subject of marriage. We're dealing with uh, all different aspects. And so far, what we've dealt with is the real purpose of marriage. And then we talked about the priority of marriage for two different times. And we've shared a lot of things that I believe are essential for our society today because we're getting further and further removed from biblical standards and we don't even recognize it. It's deception. And the worst part about deception is that you don't know you're deceived or it's not deception. The body of Christ has just little by little taken steps away from the way God intended for marriage to operate to where today we have all kinds of other things entering into our life that's literally sapping the energy and the effort that God intended to go towards marriage. So that's basically what we've been dealing with. On our program today, I'd like to begin to start sharing with you about strife and about the damage that strife has in a family and most importantly about what you do to turn that around and to stop strife. Strife is something that is not just an uh, uh, inevitable part of marriage. It's not something that has to be there. God didn't intend for it to operate. The scripture tells us exactly what it is that causes strife in marriage. And if you can find the cause of strife, well then it's just like finding a, a spigot on a water hose that you can turn that thing off and the water will quit coming out of it. If you can find the cause of strife and deal with it, then the strife will dry up at its source. And I tell you, this is something that God has really used in my life and also in the life of thousands of people that I've dealt with, and I believe it'll be a blessing to you. First of all, let's turn to James chapter 3 and verse 16. And James here is uh, ministering, and he's talking about the wisdom that comes from God, and he's trying to show that some people are saying they're operating in God's wisdom, and yet it's not. It's just earthly, sensual, and devilish. And in verse... 15, he says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And so the scripture shows us here that where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, Confusion is not of God, but it's of Satan. And so this is saying that where envying and strife is, there is the devil and everything that the devil wants to accomplish in your life. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a statement that really, if you would stop and think about it, it's one of the most awesome statements in the Word of God on a negative side, but it's still an awesome statement. I had, I've had many people come to me and say, I don't understand why we're having problems in finances. We've paid our tithes. We go to church. We do all of these things. We've been faithful givers, and yet here we've got financial problems. Well, the Bible says it's strife opens up a door to every evil work. Financial problems is an evil work. It's something that God didn't intend. And sometimes people don't recognize that because uh, they're having strife in their home that it's giving them physical problems. It's giving them financial problems. All of these things can come through strife. I've got an instance of uh, some people, and I'll try not to give much detail on this, uh, but it really was a classic example of people 
I came to the church, and just uh, two weeks before I got there, a boy had died, and the church had been standing, they had prayed, they had fasted for him to be healed, and when he died, it was just devastating to people's faith, and they were beginning to question, you know, is it really God's will to heal in every situation? The parents had done everything, they had confessed the Word of God, the church had gone on a fast, the people had done everything that they knew in God's Word to see this boy healed, and yet he wasn't healed. And so there was a lot of confusion. And it took me a couple of days talking to the parents and other people, but I finally found out that there was strife in the home. There had actually been talk about divorce. And the very day that this boy had gone to school and had had an accident, he went over to a friend's house and was shot in the head with a gun and was in a coma for like six weeks. The very day that that had happened, there had been an argument with the mother. Some harsh words were said. Strife was just running rampant. And then they were just perplexed about how could something like this happen. Now, I'm not trying to place blame, and I'm not trying to show uh, somebody as being terrible. I'm not saying that it was uh, anything, you know, that, that I'm not trying to place the blame on them, but it wasn't God's will for that boy to die. And the inroad that Satan had into that home was through strife. Strife is deadly. You know, this scripture is saying that strife is an open invitation to every evil work. Everything. You know, if you were to have a cobra in your house, a cobra snake. Now, some of you may not be afraid of snakes, but most people are. But even if, if you did, weren't, didn't have a fear of snakes, I guarantee you would not live in a house with a snake just going around, and sooner or later that thing was going to get you. You didn't know if it was going to be a day or a week or a month, but you had a cobra living in your house. I mean, many of you would draw the line right there. You would not allow something like that in your house and yet the scripture here is portraying strife as far deadlier than any snake that you could ever have. A snake may bite you. There may be an antidote for it. At the very worst, it could call physical death. But strife opens up a door to Satan and every evil work. And I guarantee you, according to John 10.10, 10, Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Strife is more deadly than any snake. It's a luxury that you cannot afford. Now, the reason I'm making such a point of this is because many of us, our reference point, we have come from families where strife was just a way of life. And we don't even recognize it. I know I've been around some people that just have a level of strife that to me is intolerable and they don't even recognize that they're in strife. Uh, I led one guy to the Lord once who had been a, a, a forecaster. He wrote these astrology charts and right before he came to... Uh, my church, he had uh, lived in a nudist colony for three years. They were into the occult. I mean, this guy was just a rank pagan. When he got born again, there was a real change in his life. And yet one day I was over at his house. He was working on a car, and he didn't see me coming. And that car just was not cooperating with him. And I mean, he had a, he had a board out there taking it to this car and cussing that thing. He kicked the tires on that car. He was saying things that I'd never even heard before. And when he saw me, he kind of stopped and looked at me, and I looked at him, and he says, well, it's a car. He says, it doesn't matter what I do. He says, it's just no car. I'm not saying this kind of thing to people. But see, what he didn't recognize is it's not the person or the object that you're mad at, strifeful at, that causes the problem, but strife is an inroad into your life. And he was giving place into saying, you can't get mad at the car. You can't get mad at the people that pass you on the freeway and you honk at them and shake your fist and say, you sorry, so-and-so. You do things like that. You may not put the two together. But see, that's an inroad of Satan into your life. And when I confronted this man about these things, he, he finally told me one time, he says, I'm going to leave this church. He says, it's just so full of strife. And I got real bold and I told him, I said, look, this church, as far as I know, didn't have any problems with strife until you came into it. I said, you're the one that's caused it. You criticize everybody because of this and that. And I said, yeah, there's some strife, but you're the instigator of it. And I was just being real bold with him. And did you know he responded by telling me his background? And the background of this man was that he was the first person in the history of California that had been indicted by the grand jury three times before he was 13 years old. He grew up without parents. He grew up in foster homes and all these kind of things. He had been in jail. He had been around such a rough thing that actually he just didn't realize how strifeful he was. And to my surprise, he began to start saying, I'm sorry. He says, I just don't know how to act. He says, what is love? How do you love somebody? He didn't have a reference point. And did you know many of us, what we consider as normal, maybe the way you grew up, you have adopted that as being normal, but it's still way below what God intended. You know, strife is much more than just when you get angry enough that you're going to take a baseball bat and hit somebody with it. That is strife. 
But strife can just be internalized. It, it can be a person that has a pity party and just sulks on the inside. You get your feelings hurt. You may not call that strife, but it is strife. It's just as damaging. What you are, you're angry, but instead of verbalizing it towards somebody inside, you just think all kinds of thoughts. There's some of you that may not be considered a very angry person, and yet I guarantee you in your heart you've considered murder, you've considered all kinds of things, and brothers and sisters, that's strife. So we need to recognize that strife comes in all different kinds of packages. It may be wrapped differently, have a different bow on it, but the contents are the same. If you're angry with a person, even if you feel like you have cause for it, then you're operating in strife. The scripture says that there is a godly type of anger, but it's supposed to be directed towards the devil. We are not warring against flesh and blood, is what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Our warfare is against principalities and powers. It's against demonic rulers and spiritual wickedness in high places. If you're angry with people, if you're unforgiving, if you've got hardness, bitterness towards somebody, then you've got strife in your heart, and it's an inroad into your life. Now, many people when I begin to start talking like this, we'll start saying, well, I can see that strife is damaging, that I shouldn't have it, but look what this person did. I mean, I don't want it, but how, how can you help? Here is a lie that we've been sold, and I tell you, this is super damaging. Most people feel justified in their anger. They really know that anger and strife, bitterness, is not God's best, but they feel justified in what they're doing. In other words, we have limits. We say, well, yes, I'm, I'm trying to walk in love as far as I can, but there's a limit. And when you begin to start setting bounds like that and saying, well, I, I'm trying to walk in love, but when a person does this, I can't help it. No, that's not what God has shown us in his word. You can see the example of Jesus that the very people who crucified him, he turned around and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If actions on someone else's part dictated a reaction on your part, then it would have been impossible for Jesus to walk in love towards the very people that were killing him. But see, you can be free. I tell you, one of the most liberating things that I've ever learned is that you do not have to be like a machine that all Satan's got to do is push your button, put one person in your path to say one thing to tick you off, and instantly a response comes. Now, if you'd be honest, the vast majority of people, even the vast majority of Christians, that's exactly the way that they are. Most people don't go out thinking, I just want to live in strife today and I'm going to see who I can get mad at. You may have good intentions. And, and specifically concerning your marriage, you may really desire, have a, have a godly desire to walk in love. But that mate says or does something, they know exactly where your hot button is and when that happens, then you, this desire just goes by the wayside and you feel in, unable to respond any other way. You feel like that when they do this, I've got to do this. I just can't sit there. I've got emotions. Well, I want to share with you that that's not freedom. Our generation has been told that, you know, it's freedom to just be yourself. Let it all hang out. If it feels good, do it. We're the me generation. We've indulged ourselves. We don't have much control over ourselves. And because of this, this is one of the reasons that marriages are falling apart at an unprecedented level today. It's not that marriage is failing. It's not that God has ceased to put his blessing on marriage. It's that we've quit walking in ways that make marriage work. And one of those things is that we have become so self-centered, so self-expressive, feeling like I've got rights and my rights have been violated and look what this person has done. We're justifying all kinds of things. So many stories are being presented on radio, television today, in these uh, movies that we watch, uh, the entertainment that we watch on television. They're justifying all kinds of things. And most people today feel justified to get a divorce at the drop of a hat. They feel justified to be angry. It's being presented that way. But brothers and sisters, I want to show you what the root cause of strife is. And I tell you, if you can understand this, if you can agree with it, you'll find out that your mate is not your problem. It's what's inside of you that makes you respond to your mate the way you do. That's the problem. Out of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, I'd like for you, if you're in a position where you can, to look this up in your Bible and read it. I'd like for you to read this because you wouldn't believe it's in the Bible if you didn't read it. You'd think for sure this is something that I'm just quoting. But Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Now that scripture says only 
by pride. It didn't say that pride is one of the ways that contention comes. It didn't say it's a major way. It's one of the important ways. It says only by pride comes contention. If you look at a corresponding scripture to this over in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14, it says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. And that scripture is showing that contention is a beginning of strife. Strife, again, there's all different levels to where you're just literally exploding and then levels where it's just beginning to see. Contention is a beginning of strife. And so in Proverbs 13, 10, when it says, only by pride cometh contention, only by pride is the inroad into strife, the beginning of strife. Now, some of you may be listening to me and thinking, well, now, I can see that in the Word, but, you know, my experience, I can't understand that. I mean, I may have a lot of problems. I've got all of these different things. I'll be the first one to admit it. But boy, uh, thinking too highly of myself is not one of my problems. A lot of Christians today are beat down. They think that they're the scum of the earth. Religion is actually fostered and encouraged that and taught it as a godly attitude. And I'd say that the vast majority of people that I minister today, to today have a real inferiority attitude. They are not confident of themselves. They just feel like they're a failure. Satan is beating people down and condemning them at an unprecedented level, unprecedented rate today. And so some people look at this and say, well, I've got strife in my life, but pride doesn't seem to be my big problem. I don't understand. What does this scripture mean? Well, before I give you the total explanation of that, one thing you've got to do is recognize that what most of us consider pride is just one part of pride. Traditionally, most people think that pride is thinking that you're better than everybody else, exalting yourself and looking down your nose at everybody else and being critical of them. Well, that is pride, but that's only one part of pride. That's like an extreme way over here on one side where you think that you're better than everybody else. But did you know that there's another extreme to it, and that is where you think that you're worse than everybody else? Did you know that um, a uh, timid person, a shy person, is a very proud person? Now, some people may think, well, I don't understand that. But pride, in its simplest terms, and I think you could probably be more detailed than this, but in its simplest terms, pride is just self-centeredness. If a person is centered on themselves thinking self is better than everybody else, that's pride. But if a person is centered on themselves thinking, man, I can't do anything. Everything I do fails. That's pride. Did you know a person, if uh, you were to stand up in front of a church group or if you were to be up trying to share what God's put in your heart. There's some of you that God has done really miraculous things, and you really do have a testimony, and you have something to share. But if you were to get up in front of people, what happens is you just freeze. I mean, there's something on the inside. It's not that you don't have something to share, and yet you freeze when you get in front of people. You know what that is? We call it shyness. We call it timidness. We call it, well, that's just my characteristics. That's my nature. You can call it what you want to, but the bottom line is it's pride. It's self-centeredness. In other words, you're so concerned about what are people thinking about me? How am I going to come across? You're so self-centered that you literally lose sight of God, lose sight of what God has done in your life, lose sight of the message. You can just literally go totally blank because of self-centeredness. Now, you know, my own personal experience would verify this because when I was in high school, I had problems relating to people. I was shy. A lot of it was religious training that I had. I, I was really outgoing at church with certain friends, but when it got around to other people, I had a terrible time relating to them. I remember uh, one time when I was a senior in high school walking down the street, and a man walked by and just said good morning. And he was two blocks down the street before I could get good morning out. I mean, I just had problems uh, relating to people, and it was all self-centeredness. And when God called me into the ministry, I guarantee you I had problems with this. I had a desire to minister. I had the Word of God burning in my heart, and yet when I'd stand up and try and minister the Word of God to people, I'd get tongue-tied. I'd become embarrassed. And I mean, the very first time I ever held a meeting, I preached three messages in five minutes the first night. And I mean, it was all over with, and it was because I was so embarrassed. I was so scared. And some people may have called that all kinds of things. What it was was self-centeredness. And one of the things that brought me out of that, I had a man speak to me one time, and he says, if you ever get more concerned about the people that you're ministering to than you are about yourself and how you're being perceived, then you'll be a success. And you know, that's been one of the things that has helped me. I've o overcome that because I'm able to be more concerned about the people that I'm ministering to than I am about myself. See, it was all self-centeredness. 
A person that is shy, a person that is timid, is actually a very, very self-centered person. It's a very proud person. Now, I'm not saying any of this to throw condemnation on you or to make you feel guilty. What I'm trying to do is to say that this scripture that says only by pride comes contention, it's true. You may not have recognized it as pride, but I promise you, only by self-centeredness, if you were to put those words in there, that is the only way that strife or contention is entering into your marriage relationship. It is not that you were born with a temper. That's not it. It's not your genes. You know, I've had people, as I taught on this kind of thing, saying, well, it's my hormones. And, uh, boy, I hesitate to bring this up. I know some people think this is out of place, but it's a problem today. And there's, you know, in our society, just in the last few years, women have actually gotten to a place where about two days a month, they say that it's their time of the month, and they just, two days a month, they have to act like the devil. I've known some people that actually believe that. You know, there's less than 5% of women that actually have a problem with like that PMS. And if you do have a problem, then God can heal you of it. What I'm saying is it's not the time of the month. It's not your hormones. It's not your um, characteristics. It's not your personality. It's nothing innate within you that you have to be that way. If you're a strifeful person, whether it's this kind that blows up and screams or internalizes it and pouts, if you're full of strife, the only reason that that's so in your life is because of self-centeredness. Because you are constantly thinking about self. Now that may not feel good to you and a lot of people may take issue with that, but if I had time I could just continue to explain this and explain it and explain it. Brothers and sisters, I believe that self-centeredness being uh, me, the most important person in my life, is the inroad of Satan. You know, actually, it's the sin that Satan had against God. God had exalted Satan. The Bible shows us this in Isaiah chapter 14. Had made him the anointed cherub that covered. He had all of this recognition, all of this glory, apparently like second in command to God himself. And yet, in Isaiah chapter 14, Satan says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above the throne of God. I'm going to be like the Most High God. Satan wasn't content with being number two. Self-centeredness, he wanted to exalt himself. He was promoting himself. Actually, sin, the very first sin, Satan's original sin against God, was a sin of pride. It was a sin that I want what you've got. And Satan has been reproducing that in the human race. When he tempted Adam and Eve in Genesis, the third chapter, he came against them with this sin of pride about God's trying to hold something back from you. Self is being denied. Self needs to be satisfied. Self could be better if you would just do something contrary to what God said. And it was because of self-centeredness that Adam and Eve actually committed the very first sin in the Garden of Eden. And the same thing is happening with us today. Our generation has been bombarded with teaching about promoting self. You know, the prosperity that we've got today, praise God for it. I thank God that He's blessed this nation, but it has literally gone wild. We've gone to an extreme, and people are indulging themselves today to where, I mean, if they don't have a brand new car, if you don't have the brand new television set, the brand new VCR, if you don't have the best of this, if self isn't indulged to a limit, that if you were to go anywhere else in the world, our standard of living... Our poverty standard of living would be prosperity. It'd be a millionaire in most other countries. I know that I've been to India, and I went into a millionaire's house. And I mean, he had a larger house than the other people, but it still wasn't air-conditioned. It still didn't look like it had been painted in 20 years. His standard of living was below what most of you would consider a poverty level, and he was a millionaire in India. Brothers and sisters, what we have become accustomed to, what we've learned to indulge ourselves with, is probably a higher standard of living more things than any generation that's ever walked on the face of the earth. We've learned, learned to indulge self. We have become more self-centered than probably any other group of people that have ever lived. And according to this scripture, only by pride comes contention. We have actually been promoting and encouraging pride, and that is one of the biggest things that's destroying marriages today. It is not your mate that's your problem. It's not your personality that's your problem. It's not just a characteristic or a trait that you've got. It's this total being consumed with self that has allowed Satan to come into our life and sow such strife in marriages today. 
Now, we're going to be dealing with this a lot more on our next session as we deal with this. We're going to be giving you the answers, the antidote to this. But first of all, you've got to recognize that your problem is not your mate. I really believe that's important. When we hold marriage seminars, couples come, and I know what they're praying. I'll even say this, and boy, I can see uh, the smiles come up on people's face. But people come to these marriage seminars dragging their mate with them thinking, God, get them. God, I'm praying that you'll change them, that you'll straighten them out. And people are constantly thinking, if I just had a different mate, that's the reason that divorce is so appealing to people. They think that it's their mate that's the problem. And yet, did you know that statistics show that once a person has a divorce, they actually have a two or three times greater chance of a divorce in the second and third and on and on. It just keeps going up. Changing mates isn't the problem. If that was the problem, it seems like after having a negative experience, you could go out and pick the right one and solve all of your problems, and second marriages ought to be just a breeze. It ought to be simple. And yet it's not that way. Many of you know by experience it's not that way. Second marriages don't solve the problem because, see, even though you get rid of that mate, you still got you. You're bringing you into the problem. Brothers and sisters, you're the problem. And I'm not saying that to condemn, but I'm saying it because it's the truth. We cannot change other people. You cannot control other people. Some people are trying to use the Word of God. Some of you may be uh, listening to this teaching on marriage thinking, boy, what key can I get from scriptures to be able to change my mate and make them what they're supposed to be? You can't do that. That's witchcraft. God doesn't control other people. He will influence them, draw them, love them, but He is not going to force them. You cannot ultimately control your mate, but what you can do is control yourself. You can let God do a work on the inside of you that is so miraculous that even though you have a mate that you feel justified in all of these things, you will have that anger on the inside of you diffused. You can deal with self. You can't effectively, totally deal with anybody but self. And I want to leave you with that today. Don't think that other people are your problem. It is not your mate that's the problem. They may be a contributing factor, but ultimately the buck stops right here. You can live with that mate. God can give you grace if you will let God begin to start dealing with self on the inside of you. Self is the real problem in marriage. And so today we've shown that only by pride, only by self-centeredness comes contention. And as you deal with self, then praise God, you'll be able to overcome strife in your marriage. If you've been ministered to today by this teaching on strife, I'd like to send you this cassette tape that will go into a lot more detail. It's a 90-minute teaching cassette where we talk about strife, the cause of strife, and praise God, God's antidote to it. If you'd like to receive this tape, all you need to do is write in to me and request our tape offer, TF13. Please use that number when you request it, TF13. This tape is a gift to you. There's no charge to it. We'll be glad to send it to you because I know God's going to use it to touch your life. But if you can help us financially, that's the way that God enables us to be on television, radio, and put out these tapes. Remember when you write in to request it, buy this number, TF13.